So China is the punchline of so much of what we've been talking about uh, because it is so big that it kind of squashes everything else you could possibly talk about. It's interesting to look at Singapore. It's interesting to look at Japan. Uh, it's interesting to talk about ourselves in relationship to all these things. But really, who cares? Uh, China is the game changer. It's the elephant in the room. In 1991, I gave one of my first lectures in public ever, and I was uh, giving a lecture in Indonesian in Java. And uh, at the end of the lecture, someone raised their hand and said, now, let me see if I'm getting you straight. Cars are bad? You know, and there's this incredulous tone in their voice. They couldn't believe that was possible. And it was the first thing I had said in the talk that, you know, we in the West have been tremendously successful in so many different ways. And we had no way of knowing really how profoundly uh, devastating the impact of some of these things would be. The biggest single one is the automobile. If, if the mayors of the United States had the opportunity to switch places with you, the mayors of, of Indonesia, they would jump at it. Why would they jump at it? Because Indonesian towns have not yet sprawled out across the landscape requiring everyone to use cars. And we'd be actually much closer to implementing the land use patterns and architectural arrangements, the formal spatial arrangements that we know we, we all know we need to do, which is reduce the dependence on the automobile uh, and use mass transit, use walking, use bicycling. We all know that we have to do this. It's inevitable. It's just very expensive to tear down all those freeways and reconcentrate populations in compact zones. We're doing it, but it's going to take us 100 years to do it. Um, you guys are already there. And so that was the, the nature of my talk in Indonesia. Um, but it was just over their heads. Uh, it didn't really sink in. And I had several people throughout my time and continuing to today, even uh, a year ago when I was there, repeating the same thing. We will not know the truth of what you say until we make all the mistakes you made and find ourselves up the creek without a paddle. And then we will be in a position to do what you did. And this relates very directly to the teleological pathway of development. You start uh, pre-industrial, you go through the Industrial Revolution, you follow the exact same path that the United States and England did, and you arrive uh, where you arrive 40 years later to where they are. But that's a trick. We know now from history that that is a dirty trick. We hold up that picture and say, be patient, your time will come. And we constantly postpone that time. And in the meantime, we have this beautiful access to vast pools of cheap labor. We get to desecrate the planet. And once it's completely desecrated and leaving a desert wasteland, there's still 40 years, they're still caught in the 1950s. Uh, before the development boom, and we uh, were the ones who end up with all the wealth. Well, China, as we talked about last time, uh, is rewriting that story. Um, this is a picture of China. Uh, this is Shanghai. I don't know if one of our lecturers showed this before, but this is the fishing village uh, surrounded by a moat connected to the hinterlands of China by canal system because water transportation is basically free. Uh, the amount of work it takes, the amount of energy, the amount of calorie energy it takes to move a ton of, of stuff, uh, 10, 100 kilometers, is almost negligible. It costs so much more to move it by truck or even by rail um, that canals have always been basically free, which explains a lot about the Erie Canal, the Great Lakes, why Chicago is so important. Um, and then, I don't know if anyone mentioned the Opium War. I think uh, our guest, uh, Nan, uh, mentioned the Opium War. But I think it's worth mentioning it again. Um, money uh, for tea is the reason why 
the, the British needed to grow opium and make, uh, make all these drugs in India. So the British love tea. British are famous for loving tea. The tea came from China. They have to buy that tea. In order to buy that tea, they need Chinese currency. There was no international exchange of currency. So uh, the British needed to sell as much stuff to the Chinese as the British needed to buy from the Chinese. So in order to buy all that tea, the British had to sell just as much value to the Chinese. And they had nothing the Chinese wanted. The Chinese were fine. They didn't want anything. And so they pulled out the secret weapon, opium. And they got uh, vast populations addicted. And the Chinese government, if we had our prezi up here, we'd say government intervention. They said, no, 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 no. Well, it was the emperor. He said, no, you, please, no. I'm not going to let you um, keep pushing opium in our country. You're destroying our social structure. And so to stop the British from pushing opium in China, they seized the cargo of one of the ships. The British said, this is an act of war. The opium war occurred to defend the, the free trade, uh, a lot like NAFTA and other free trade agreements today. Um, they were defending free trade, and they bombed and destroyed uh, the Chinese ships and won the right to sell opium to whoever they wanted. And they also gained control of Shanghai. And so Shanghai became a booming metropolis, uh, a skyline second only to Manhattan. Uh, the port area became uh, a, a symbol of architectural expression, uh, full of architectural icons of corporate power and international power. Very effective message um, construction, cultural construction of Shanghai as an international port, not a Chinese city. Um, during, uh, in 1949, the, uh, Mao Zedong uh, won a war against uh, the government of China, uh, the revolution of 1949, and introduced communism to China. And under Mao Zedong, uh, it was important to even out the playing field and make sure everyone had the same amount of wealth. And so step one, uh, empty the cities. And so China was industrializing in the context of communism by moving factories to the villages. And in that context, cities emptied out. And the Bund was very carefully preserved, the Bund on the left side of the screen, the waterfront uh, that we were just looking at on the last slide. And, uh, and so it was after uh, Mao's death in 1978, Deng Xiaoping uh, took over as the premier of China and opened up China to the West. Um, in 1979, I had a chance to go to China, um, but my traumatic experience uh, was that um, my parents didn't want to pay the money it would take to let me go to China. It was the first school group to go to China since 1949. Um, my classmates had their picture on the cover of People magazine. Um, and I've been overcompensating ever since, um, uh, including living in Asia for many, many years. Uh, and so um, China opened up suddenly and dramatically in 1978, 1979, the open door policy, capitalism. Uh, he's, his famous statement that characterizes this whole period is, it doesn't matter whether the cat is white or black as long as it catches the mouse. And so this is uh, an allusion to the pragmatism of uh, the liberating oneself from ideology. It doesn't matter if you follow communism or capitalism, as long as you rake in a lot of money and power, then it works. So the whole story of Shanghai is that uh, by crossing the river and building the infrastructure, the tunnels and bridges, to uh, move Shang expand Shanghai to the eastern side of the Huangpo River. Uh, all of a sudden, you can build a brand new city, and they did. And they did it by hiring architects from the West uh, to compete with design ideas. And this is characteristic of the whole process. They basically took what they knew, um, 
China, uh, here's Paris. We saw these, I believe. Uh, you overlay Paris onto this territory and you start by emulating the cities that have been successful. Uh, and you end up with this fantastic uh, skyline, um, several of the tallest buildings in the world, as an expression, as a cultural icon, as an architecture, as conveying the clear message Shanghai has arrived. Shanghai is a global city. Shanghai is a world uh, capital of finance and industry and power and money. And um, that's too small. You've seen that. This is what you're supposed to look at when, you, uh, when I say the words, when I talk about Mao, the important relationship between the Soviet Union and China, um, which explains why a lot of the architecture after 1949 and before 1979 looks very much like the slab housing projects of the Soviet Union. Comparison between skylines of Manhattan and Shanghai around the same time. Um, this competitive emulation includes Century Boulevard at the center of Pudong um, on the east side of the Huangpo River. Uh, the instructions to the French architect was make this avenue wider than the Champs-Élysées. Until then, Champs-Élysées was the widest boulevard. The mission uh, was to create a boulevard that was one meter wider than the Champs-Élysées. Mission accomplished. And so uh, in the reading, you'll see um, Tom Campanella talking about China as the home of the biggest, tallest, widest, fattest, most expensive, most elite, all of these things, um, all in one place. Uh, and so let's leave. Um, when you graduate, uh, a lot of people's advice is go where the action is. Get experience in places that is actually building stuff. And in the reading, uh, Campanella will recommend uh, this as a destination for architects because there is still a place for audacious form, huge megalomaniacal, ego-driven, crazy form-making is in high demand. Uh, Dubai is cute, but China is where the real action is because uh, it's so big. And they don't always get it right. Um, they build things really quickly and sometimes they fall down. This is, uh, and the kind of audacious ego-driven architecture uh, if you talk about the stupid diagram and just push the button and it becomes a building, here we go. Uh, it's all about that. Um, we're fine with that. In China, you can find this in spades. And in the 2010 World Exposition of Architecture, um, this is pretty much the theme where you take a caricature of vernacular form and you blow it up uh, using Photoshop or whatever. And so it's one audacious uh, building after another. Um, uh, it's compared in the reading to the World's Fair in Chicago uh, in 1893 that set the stage for American triumphalism. Uh, and this is certainly one of the important things about China. Um, back in the 19th century, uh, in 20th century, it was all about the United States. And, uh, and the United States was the powerhouse. It was the fastest growing and soon became the largest economy in the world. And nothing really mattered globally as much as the United States mattered. And uh, for the 100 years, the United States was the most important game in town and dominating everything else simply because our economy was growing the fastest and we were the largest economy. Well, that is about to shift over unless collapse happens in an uncontrolled manner and they don't recover from it. Uh, China is set up to be uh, the next powerhouse. But in the last few moments of American power, uh, my talk in Indonesia, uh, acknowledged this, that Asia is where the boom was, was going to happen, uh, that 
Asia was the place that was important. Um, and it almost didn't matter, and I say almost, it almost doesn't matter if the United States gets its act together or not. The United States, with 4% of the global population, consumes 25% of the resources and contributes 25 or more percent of the pollution. Uh, the burden of global climate change is uh, the United States' burden to bear. Um, and it almost doesn't matter in the next century whether America gets its act together or not, because it doesn't matter because of the population. What really matters is China. But in the last moments of American uh, power, the real power of the United States is cultural. Like it or not, China still makes money by copying the United States. This is a copy of England, but it's a copy of England using the methods of Southern California, as we've talked about this semester. And so, if this is what Americans do, this is what we're going to do, is often the case, uh, the approach of Asian cities and especially China. <clears throat> and so there's a brief moment where the people responsible for the cultural constructions of the United States, and especially architects, there's a moment of influence where uh, we can actually influence what happens in China, and China is the big game in town. If uh, China can employ models that have been developed um, that lead to outcomes, different outcomes than what we did, then we can turn this around. If they continue to do things the way we did things after World War II, then it's over um, before it starts. There's just no hope. Um, but we have very bizarre situations where the, uh, in the context of the Disneyland uh, Thames town, you still have um, the life of the Chinese occurring. Um, they're doing their laundry uh, and hanging it out to dry on these cobblestone streets that are supposed to be for tourism. They're living in these high-rise towers with washing machines, but they still prefer to wash their clothes in the creek. Um, Here's the layout of the different Thames Town. One of them is Thames Town. Uh, this is Shanghai, but Holland Village, uh, all these different themed towns. This is, these are the, uh, the new town constructions, the product of architects, the cultural constructions of architects, including Eco City. Um, but a close exam of the Eco City approach yields just another marketing scheme. And so here's Holland Town, Holland Village. Uh, here's Thames Town. Um, it's empty except for the photography. Um, the, one of the big points is that more people have moved to cities in China than the entire population of uh, Europe. Uh, and this is the largest migration of humanity in the history of the world. And so there's, uh, I could, I didn't have time to construct a time lapse and that's not clear enough to bother with. Um, but the, uh, here's the, the, um, the eco town. Um, so the question becomes, what is eco about the eco town? Sorry about these. You saw that. You saw that. So this is um, a view of the transformation. These are the slides I'm trying to get to. So um, this is a slide of the same place uh, over time. Um, sorry that got cut off. But it's farmland until it becomes, starts to be developed, and then it fills in. And so this is what happens over time. And so the, comparing the far left to the far right, this is over the course of uh, two or three decades, this is the kind of transformation that occurs. So we go from largely agriculture to developing 
and filling in. And this kind of study is um, is available for hundreds of towns. Here's uh, this is the kind of landscape filled with villages that when the infrastructure goes in, it becomes the town. And um, the story of Mr. Sun is that as his village became more wealthy, he built a house. And then that house uh, was quickly replaced by high rise, by high rise construction. And so his town, his little village, as everyone in the village is moved in to these new towers, um, it's, uh, it's something that happens without, not everyone moves from the countryside to the city. Many, many people stay right where they are and the city comes to them and uh, as other people flock to those locations. And um, looking back uh, at the single urban paradigm that we started with in this semester, we see, uh, we see that thesis really put to rest. Some things are the same, but there are so many things that are so completely different. Even Tom Campanella doesn't quite get this right. Uh, he talks about suburban sprawl and he goes on and on about uh, how it's different than American suburban sprawl. It is so different. I mean, this is suburban sprawl. It's high-rise towers. Uh, it's so different, it's not even worth mentioning American sprawl. Uh, it has nothing to do with American suburban sprawl. It is completely different. It is all about land speculation. Uh, the other thing that is completely missing from China is there is no national identity construction going on here. It is pure and simple capitalist development of generating money to drive the economy. A vast amount of the income and wealth that China is enjoying comes from cheap labor and your, the production of your cell phones. See how it all comes back together? The Foxconn factories employ hundreds of thousands of workers, uh, two buildings right next to each other. One's the fact they look the same. One's the factory and one's the dormitory because workers live in plywood boxes inside this huge, vast warehouse factory buildings. Um, as in Indonesia. Uh, but the Foxconn factory complexes are only a portion of the, of the wealth. The biggest source of wealth in China is from the land. The, just like Indonesia, there was no land market. There was no real estate market. And in the 1970s, Indonesia invented the real estate market. All of a sudden, something that had no value has some value and then it has a lot of value, and then it has a ridiculous amount of value, and you can borrow money based on that increasing value, uh, assuming that it continues for the next 30 years, you can borrow money. And all of a sudden, you generate vast amounts of wealth. The wealth of China is generated by land speculation, something that had no value 30 years ago, now drives the global economy. The American deficit, the deficit spending of American people and the American government is financed by China. China purchases the debt of the United States. They, are, they can purchase that debt because of the architecture in this slide. Because the land value uh, is boosted by this type of construction, that is what drives the entire global economy. And you better hope that this gamble at the roulette wheel of land speculation pays off because when it falters, the global economy will cr come crashing down and uh, all the cheap labor in the world developing your cell phones won't save the global economy. It's about the land speculation that drives this development and is driven by this development.